Hi, welcome to this week's Authors Love Readers podcast, where we delve into the stories behind the stories. We're asking authors questions, some of them fun, some of them serious. And from their answers, you're going to learn things you never knew about the people who write the stories you love. My name is Patricia McGlynn. I'm your host and designated question asker. I'm Eve Gaddy, and I'm an author who loves readers. Now, let's start the show. Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of Authors Love Readers Podcast. I have with me this week Eve Gaddy, and I was trying to think of how long we have known each other. I think it is sort of lost in the mists of time, (laughs) at least for me. We've known each other a long time through um, writing for Harlequin slash Silhouette and through the Romance Writers of America. Um, so it's got to be 20 years? 20 years at least, I would think. Yes. And now also um, through Novelist Inc., as many of our listeners know, that, that tends to be a recurring theme. <laughs> so, Eve, tell us a little bit about, tell the, the listeners what you write. Um, I write a little of everything. I, I write mostly um, contemporary romance and contemporary romantic suspense. Um, recently, it's been more just romance, uh, but although I, I do have some romantic suspense coming out. Um, and then I wrote one big romantic suspense and one, um, I call it my kitchen sink book because it's... <laughs> Well, it's got everything. It's got, um, it's, it's, it's set in three time periods and it's, oh, it's a reincarnation interracial romance set in three time periods. So. (laughs) And what's the, what's the title of that? Cry Love. C-R-Y? C-R-Y. Okay. Cry Love. I think from a uh, John Hyatt song. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Uh, I think readers sometimes are, um, taken aback by the terminology that writers use. And, and uh, I think we're pegged into it by um, the business side, especially uh, in uh, the old business model with uh, traditional publishers where you had to be in a certain place in stores. So like either, even there wasn't a place for romantic suspense. You either had to be romance, you were shelved with romance, or you were shelved with thrillers. Can you, in a second, (laughs) encapsulate for the readers the difference between, like you said, romance, you said romantic suspense, then you said a big romantic suspense. So uh, if any readers are not familiar with romantic suspense, how would you, what are the essentials of romantic suspense to you? Well, I think that it's where the, the romance and the suspense are equal parts. Like one feeds the other. You don't have much of a book without one or the other. And um, it kind of depends if it's, I'd say my big book because it's longer and more complicated. Mm. And some of my, some of my shorter ones are, you know, not as much suspense, but there's definitely suspense. So, but I still, I think, to me, a perfect romantic suspense is one that each builds on the other. You know, if you don't have romance, you, you don't have it. And if you don't have suspense, you don't have it. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Another question I have is when you start a book, when you, when you first, not even when you start, when you first have a, an idea, are you clear from the beginning that it's going to be either a romance with no suspense or a romantic suspense? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, before, before we get really deep into the writing, cause we can come back to that again, but um, I'll let you think about that a little bit. Uh, let, let's let the listeners get to know you just for some fun stuff. And I want to start, did you have a song when you were, you know, high school, college been in there and you had a song that you thought really defined you or spoke to you? Well, it, it doesn't really define me, but it, I guess it's 
you know, one of my very favorite songs of all time, and that's Layla by Eric Clapton. And it's the original rock and roll version. <laughs> and I've told my children multiple times until they probably want to scream that I want that played at my funeral. Uh... <laughs> I love them if they don't. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> So that's that. And no, does it, you know, it doesn't mean anything for my life or anything. I just love the song. Well, but then that kind of weaves into your life, I think, when you really love a song like that. Yeah. Um, it shows up well, during. I love music, and it's very important to me in my writing as well. Hmm. How? Um, well, if I don't have a playlist for that particular book, it's much harder. And I can't listen to the playlist while I'm writing because I get too distracted. But I listen to it at other times, like before and in the car and things like that. I mean, I cannot tell you how many times I listen to the song Cry Love. I, mm -hmm. I, a zillion. Oh, one of the songs is Passengers, Let Her Go. I don't know if you've heard that, but um, that's that's one of the songs for my current book. So anyway, I, I forgot where we were. <laughs> well, we were talking about we were talking about music and songs. And do you ever find that your playlist evolves as you're writing the book? Yes, definitely. Mm. Sometimes, you know, I'll be listening to the radio or something and I'll hear a song and I'll go, oh, my God, that's perfect for the book. Mm -hmm. Do you refer to them in the book or is this more kind of getting you in the mode and in the mood? Oh, it's mostly getting me in the mood and in the mode, but sometimes I do refer to them. It, I refer to songs in the books. It isn't always one of those songs, but mm -hmm. well, uh, probably Mm, at least a fourth of the time it is. I have two songs um, that Hal Ketchum has sung that uh, have led to books. Um, one is, um, the, and then the book has the title, is Where Love Lives. Uh -huh. um, and the other one I'm trying to remember the title of, um, but it, it's the singer has always loved this girl, but she married... Um, his friend and now the friend is coming to the singer saying, you know, this isn't what I thought it would be. And, 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 and the singer's like, you know, I'd take her in a heartbeat. So, <laughs> and that became, that became the backstory for my book um, at the heart's command. And when you talked about listening to it so many times in the car, I thought about I I got to the point my dog would poke me in the back because I was <laughs> like, that one again. I know. <laughs> so, I know. Please no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I knew kids would do that. People would do that. I had no idea that a dog <laughs> would get sick of a song. But yes. Oh, that's funny. So, and, and so we sort of segue. Now, do you have, of all these songs that you're listening to now, do you have any that, um, or one that means a whole lot to you beyond an individual book? Beyond an individual book? Uh, hmm. No, not a particular one. I okay. mean, I like many so they're, um, they're associated with the books yeah well but not all of them I mean you know I I have very eclectic musical tastes I like a little bit of everything um you know <laughs> one of my books had um the monster by M Eminem <laughs> which is rap and I don't as a rule like rap but I really like that song and it's got Rihanna singing it too and it's really interesting and you know I, d I don't care for jazz. My husband loves it. And I was thinking the other day, please don't play any more jazz. I'm so sick. <laughs> <laughs> I like a little bit of it, but not the things he likes. But, you know, I, I just I just think music, I don't know what it, it, it just talks to me and all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I do. I love to hear different things and. People will tell me different ones. I do a little song of the day thing that I post 
oh, on Twitter and Facebook and some other places. And uh, so I've, I've gotten a lot of new music, new to me anyway. So. Oh, that's cool. That's a great way. I I tend to really like the words in music, which is why I cannot write with music with words because I will type the words. So I need to have instrumental and I tend to do classical. And I, yeah, I, put, classical. so you don't write with music at all? Not usually. Um, if it's classical and it's your instrumental, I, I get distracted by that too. I very much problems with getting distracted. So um, um, humming and I'm, you know, thinking about song instead of the book. So I, I usually listen to music before and after and in between and all that. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's go, let's get hit you with some uh, easier ones. Like what's your favorite color? Blue. A specific color? Shade of blue or and do you, blue. Uh, is any blue. why? I just think it's pretty. I mean, you know, I I don't have a you don't have particular thing. associations with it or. I think it's calming to me. Well, most of it. I mean, you know, there's some that bright blue and everything. I don't guess is really calming, but I just I just think it's a pretty color. Oh, okay. And has that always been your favorite color or has it changed over your life? Always. Uh, okay. You're loyal. <laughs> How about a favorite taste? Taste. Uh, chocolate. Mm. Good choice. Well, no, well, so dark chocolate or white chocolate, yeah. milk chocolate, which would be your chocolate, yeah. Okay. And, and I kind of recently, unfortunately, <laughs> discovered milk chocolate with caramel center um, <gasps> of that Ghirardelli. They have these <laughs> chocolates. Oh my God, they're so good. <laughs> I mean, I can't, I can't buy those because, you know, they're gone in an instant and there's way too many of them to be gone in an instant. Believe me. <laughs> there is, um, there's a company called Fannie Mae that's a Chicago um, chocolate maker. And so it's sort of a family tradition. My mom's family is from Chicago area. And uh, they have something called Pixies that are chocolate on the outside, caramel and nuts on the inside. Oh, oh, they are wonderful. And they make them both dark chocolate now and milk chocolate. But Pixies mm. are one of the wonders of the world. <laughs> I love those, yes. So do you have any strong fears? And do you use fears in your books? Well, I, I don't really like heights anymore. It did, they didn't used to bother me, but... Um, I, I have some rather funny stories about that. I and I when I ski, I, if I'm on a chairlift, I have to look straight ahead because I if I look down, it freaks me out. Well, and I'm going to reveal something here. Um, Eve is height challenged. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you're, I was thinking of you being on a ski chair and and you're up there higher than. The, I'm pretty tall, so um, I can see where that would concern you. Well, it's it's the height. Like um, I thought, it was okay, and then we went to oh, it was been a long time now. But when our my kids were little, my husband and I took them to the East Texas Fair, which is a sort of an interesting thing. <laughs> and they had those those rides, you know, like they have at the Midway and all. Yeah, and. So we got on, I think it was the octopus or something, and I started freaking out and got high. And so my husband's waving at him, and, you know, they have to stop each one when they go around, uh -huh. and they stop each one and let people out. They skipped us. <laughs> and I'm going, get me off of here. And my husband's like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, so humiliated. <laughs> <laughs> and have you no, have you ever doesn't. have you ever used that in a book? No, you know I haven't. I, I've used a lot of experiences and friends' experiences and stuff, but um, not that. You know that would be 
I should write that down. Okay. Friends experiences though. Has that ever gotten you in trouble? Mm, no, because it's, you know, it's not, if it's something about a friend's experience, n- nobody knows who that is. Well, except the friend does. I, I think I've told on the on the podcast before I had a friend telling me about a just horrible first date, just <laughs> horrible things happening. And as she's telling me this, I'm, uh, I wasn't consciously thinking anything, but she suddenly said, don't you dare, <laughs> don't you dare use that in a book. I see that look in your face. <laughs> and I got to admit, I was sort of thinking I could use this in a book someday. <laughs> so. well, well, so the, some of the most, well, terrible ones, um, my friends that I've talked to about it actually knew that it was for a book that, you know, I wanted, you know, I was just, I don't know how we got started talking about it because, you know, it's, they were not subjects that you generally talk about. But, um, you know. Uh, so you had their permission. Yeah. 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 And, and it's not like I say, oh, so-and-so told me this, you know. I Yeah, I think it, it's um, good for the friendship that you make sure you have the, the permission first before you recycle their life traumas into into well, a novel long ago i named um the cat in this story uh rosalind after rosalind also wrote and unfortunately i figured out that the cat was going to die oh. it had yes but it was very important to the plot and you know honest it really was because i hate that and i didn't want to do that but Anyway, so I told her, and she was, she was like, you killed the cat? Well, and didn't the reader say that to you? You killed the no. cat? No. no really? Well, it makes me feel like it, it was reasonable, you know, because, I mean, it wasn't like I had some horrific, you know, it's just the heroine was very, very closed off. And, you know, when her cat died, she acted like it was no big deal, but inside she was a total wreck and you know the hero was like you know it's okay to be upset that your cat died and she's a doctor and she's like well I people die all the time you know what's a what's a cat you know yes I'll miss her but you know and then she goes into the bathroom you know melts down yeah so, so I guess that it didn't bother him I don't know <laughs> I, see, I would be with the readers going, hey, <laughs> because I had um, I was listening to a dateline the other night and they had uh, this woman who who killed another woman and was doing all these horrible things. Among the other things she did was she set a fire in her own house that killed the family pets. Mm. And I, I'm like, that's it. <laughs> Pull the plug. She's a goner. I I just, whoa. I mean, this was really sad, but, you know, pets get cancer just like people do. You know? I don't like that. Well, I don't either. Normally, like I say, I, I, tr- I usually don't do it, but that was, that was that book and I couldn't help it. So did Rosalind ever, Rosalind ever uh, forgive you? Oh, for, yeah. For in killing fact, her namesake? In another book, I named a building after her last name. Yeah. And, it up. and you didn't <laughs> blow it up? Oh, you did blow it up? I did. <laughs> but you knew that going in. <laughs> We're going to have to do something in, you know, that endures. Name a mountain after her or something. <laughs> That, that is not a volcano that can go. Poor soul. So, okay, let's come back. Um, do you have any childhood books that you were really significant to you? I, I, I often think that those are the ones that get us addicted on story. So, well, I, I always remember the Velveteen Rabbit. That um, was one of my favorites. Love that's that sweet. Then, did you read that to your kids too? Uh huh. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, the main one I remember reading to my kids was Good Night Moon because I had to read it to my daughter 800,000 times. (laughs) 
I mean, she loved it, but I got to where I could totally recite it, you know, because one time we were somewhere and we didn't have the book and I said, oh, I'll just tell it to you. <laughs> Good night, man. <laughs> See, I, I'm an aunt and I, I've been an aunt since I was 11, 12, something like that. So um, <laughs> I would I would change up the stories and they go, that's not right. <laughs> what do you know, kid? <laughs> you can't read. <laughs> I, w- I was uh, I was a little wicked. And then I babysat and I told these kids across the street, I don't know why I'm admitting this, but I told them, <laughs> I told them that um, they had to go to sleep or otherwise the germs came. And the germs ha- were little men with bowler hats. And the only way if the germs got in, in their systems, the only way they could get them out was to stand on their heads. And the, the kids stand on their heads and have them come out the ends of their hair. So... <laughs> So the mother comes over a couple of days after I'd been babysitting and said to my mother, is, is, is there something I should know? Because <laughs> her kids are trying to stand on the top on their heads. So, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> those are good kids. I like those kids. We had a good time. Um, okay. Most of us as writers have at least one bad habit word. <laughs> Um, I, I'm really afraid I'm going to run into somebody uh, on these podcasts who doesn't, and then I will have to stop liking them. So don't be that person, Eve. Oh, tell us, tell us your your uh, bad habit word. Just and probably obviously. Ooh. Obviously. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That yeah. one. That's one you can really. Um, then you have to- and take it out. Well, if it's obvious, why are you saying obvious? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, when you go back over it and you're going, why did I say that? That was dumb. <laughs> I did, sometimes I find clearly, and I will have the same reaction of, oh, yeah, if yeah. it was clear, why are you saying clearly? You know, to myself. So, a word. Just a word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because to use those words sometimes it's just just when you move use them you know constantly well and I, I go through a phase where I you know you just write you just kind of blurt out the the draft and then wow. when I go when I go back and um, I do word searches for for my bad habit words and I take them out and then I go back and read it again and I'm often finding I'm putting some of those words back in because of the rhythm or, right. or the meaning or, or, you know, that, it, that they require them. And then if I do another read, then I'm taking them out again. I, so if I find myself putting words back in for the second time, I think, okay, I might've gone through this manuscript enough. <laughs> I think you better let it go at this point. Uh, yeah. I do it specifically. I mean, I, if I notice that, you know, I've used a word too much. I'll, I'll take it out or try to think of a different word or something. But mostly on that, I rely on my copy editor to say, well, you've used this 20 times on this one page, you know, or something like that. But they don't usually say 20. <laughs> so I'm because, I guess because I'm an editor in my past life, I always feel like if the copy editor catches something, I, I tell myself they're doing their job, but I feel like I failed. <laughs> Nah, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> uh, I wish. <laughs> it's something I really should have known. It's dumb. And I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> Why did I do that? Uh, thank you for noticing. <laughs> well, I do feel thank you for, for catching it. But it, then there's always the the addition of why didn't I catch it? <laughs> so, uh, well, you're close to your own work, I think. That's true. That's absolutely true. And for a lot of things, your brain, yeah. uh, they've done... I've, really interested in brain science and they've they have found that we fill in so much that what we think we're we're perceiving um is often kind of a, the old line from lily tomlin a collective hunch um that we're just 
we aren't actually seeing everything we think we're seeing. We're seeing parts of it. And then our brains fill in the gaps, which I find fascinating. But that also means that when you're trying to copy edit, and especially if you wrote it, you know what's supposed to be there. So that's what you see. Right. You think you've, you've explained it clearly and sometimes you have not. Yeah. Well, and even the, the um, I have a bad habit of, um, but from being years as a sports writer, I tend to write uh, type field when I mean filed. And I will look at it 10 times. And to me, it, it I think it's filed. But in fact, I've typed field. You know? Yeah. yeah. So I shouldn't reveal that. <laughs> Keep, yeah. I should readers keep my foibles. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, readers everywhere are going to be checking all my books for field where it should be filed. Well, if you find it, tell me, readers, please, wow. and I will. I will fix. It. I will have somebody else fix it because I would probably retype field. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have. I can't remember how to spell for some reason. They look weird. Like probably I know how to spell it, but sometimes I look at it and I think that just doesn't look right. Did you have a story, and not not all writers do this, but I think a lot of us have, is that um, especially from your pre-author days that you didn't like the ending of, so you rewrote it, whether that was in your head or you actually rewrote it. Uh, yes, I rewrote them in my head, and interestingly, because you know, we were talking about animals, it, those animal stories like White Fang and um, what's the one? Is White Fang the one where he pulls the sled across the finish line and dies? Oh. There's another one. I think that's right. I, I, more, as soon as you started to say it, I got tracked yeah. under Old Yeller. Yes, oh. that was uh, Old Yeller, that one. You know, any of the ones where... It did not end satisfactorily for the animal. I was like, forget it. <laughs> In fact, there's a movie that made me not watch Tom Hanks for 20 some odd years, Turner and Hooch. Did you ever see that movie? Oh, I've seen parts of it, I think. I don't think I've ever seen the whole thing. The dog doesn't make it at the end? The dog dies. <gasps> I mean, he gets. He gets a girlfriend and they have babies and blah, blah, blah. But the dog dies. And my seven-year-old daughter watched it with us because we had no idea that the dog was going to die. And she was absolutely hysterical for weeks. I kid you not, weeks. And I did not watch another Tom Hanks movie for at least 20 years because I was so mad. <laughs> okay, well, we got way off. Let's see. Oh. Oh, oh, I must ask you, I have my my very own desert island and it has some peculiar rules because you can it has facilities for playing movies, but <laughs> you can only play three movies forevermore. And um, that's all you can watch on this desert island. So which three movies are you going to select? Can Lord of the Rings be one movie? You Authors are so sneaky. <laughs> well, if it can, I want that. Okay. <laughs> and if not, I want the two towers with Aragorn and, oh, my God. Yeah. So I, I could do that. Okay. Well, um, pick Lord of the Rings, so that's one. Probably maybe The Last of the Mohicans because it's just so pretty. I mean, it, it's tragic, of course, but it. It is, to me, it is so romantic. I mean, in the broad sense of the word, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. as, in the, mean, but, as in the romance poets. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and also, you've seen it, right? Yes. Okay. So, it, at the end, when the Englishman is saying, take me, take me, and he's talking in French, and they don't know what's going on, and... You know, he, he basically sacrifices himself for the woman. And I hated him up to that time. And I was like, my God, he really does love her. Mm. Because it, it was very interesting to me. I, I, every time I see that movie, I, I think about that and some other scenes. Of course, Daniel Day-Lewis, what can I say? Anyway, um, and let's see, one more. Almost Famous, because the mm -hmm. music. 
Hmm. Oh, that, that makes sense. You, it, it's interesting because a lot of times um, when folks pick movies, I can see connections. And I can see connections between Lord of the Rings and Last of the Mohicans. <laughs> I can the the the, yeah. the journey for you sure. know if, if sure. nothing else and and the challenges that that they face a lot less with almost famous I guess there's a journey yeah. in a way it's a different kind of journey yeah yeah okay well that's that's yeah. interesting on your um on your desert island and if if I let you only have one spice to flavor your meals on this desert island what is that going to be well it's probably boring but salt <laughs> that's probably a safe a safe pick especially on a desert island you could learn to salt yeah. your meat just like the people in the from those well, last of the mohican <laughs> days you know you would have salt available from the water well i didn't i, didn't. I did not say it was a um seawater Desert Island. It's an island. I don't know. What else is in a really big lake, like Lake Michigan, I, you could have a desert island. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Not sure. I okay. <laughs> How about in my world, you could. <laughs> okay. Do you have any? It's your world, though. Do, isn't that the best part about writing? Though it's our world. <laughs> I can do it if I want. <laughs> Do you have any um, quotes, motivational or upbeat quotes, that you particularly like? There's a Nora Roberts quote, and I won't say the bad word. (laughs) (laughs) But it's, my top three pieces of writing advice. Stop whining and write. Stop screwing around and write. Stop making excuses and write. Nora Roberts. (laughs) All right. So, yeah, and you can imagine what the word is. So. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I I think we've established that I have a hard time concentrating sometimes, and so I, I fiddle around, and I, you know, oh, there's something that needs cleaning, and oh, you know, my office looks terrible, which, of course, it does all the time, so that's nothing new. But, you know, there's always something that needs to be done, so that I can procrastinate a bit longer. Well, now my question is when you are writing, when, so you've gotten past all that and you're actually writing, do you come easily out of the writing also? Or once you're writing, you're, it's hard for you to come out of the writing. I'm in the world. Okay. Yeah. Very hard. Then I'm not so sure that it's procrastination precisely i think of it as inertia and that uh, I, cuz i <clears throat> have some <laughs> too that whatever i'm doing i want to keep doing and it's hard yeah. for me to switch so it's hard me for me to switch into writing and then it's hard for me to switch out of writing yeah so you know what call it inertia me. instead of procrastination <laughs> i have inertia sometimes <laughs> But, you know, it's funny to me that, say, I have, you know, 15 minutes before I have to go somewhere. And I know I have to go somewhere. And so, and I, of course, haven't written what I'm supposed to write that day. And so I sit in front of the computer and then I write, 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 write really fast. And it's like, oh, okay. And everything's coming. And then I have to leave. Yeah. But it it is like 10 minutes, 15 minutes before that I can get going. It's the pressure, I guess. I've been told. About yes, I, I, I absolutely. I have exactly the same thing. I've always thought that it was deadline pressure. Um, I think so. And, and maybe that the, just the idea that you know you can't make it up it's because it, it does. It operates for me the same in other things in life. You know, like picking up the house. If I should be picking up the house and I have a day. It'll take a day. (laughs) I should be picking up things around the house and I have 10 minutes. Holy moly, I can get a lot done in 10 minutes, you know? Um, Yeah. So, and I, one of the things I wonder is whether I went into journalism, whether journalism helped train me to deadline or whether I went into journalism because I needed deadlines. 
to let go of things. That's not my reason. Yeah. I think I, I just write better under pressure. I wish I didn't. I really wish well, I didn't. Well, it's better than not writing well under, <laughs> under pressure. So, you know. Um, you can always go back and fix it. That's another quote is you, you can't fix a blank page. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, you can. I have a hard time with that sometimes, though, because if I know that it's bad, I have a hard time writing it. I mean, I have to like, Ugh, and, and then I look at it the next day and I think, why did I think that was so bad? That's not bad. Isn't that a lesson? Um, <laughs> I think we, I, I think we all do that. And th- one of, it. one of the early things I learned um, was never to throw anything out because, uh, you know, delete it big chunks. Uh, yeah. Even if I think, oh, okay, this is this is not taking me where I need to go, I will cut and paste it into a different file and hold on to it for a while. And um, sometimes it just disappears, but sometimes it ends up back in the book. Sometimes it goes to a different book or a different place in that book. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. I keep all that stuff. I mean, my final file, with, along with all the things I've taken out or changed or whatever, it's huge. I also think that um, a lot of writing is making decisions. And so when you start off, you can go so many different directions. And as you start writing and, and working through the book, that you have to make decisions and you have to let some potential aspects go. You can't yeah. pursue everything. Um that's true. And I, I, that is the slowest part for me, <laughs> letting go. I don't, I don't want to. Um, and that may also be where I can write faster when, when there's less time because I don't have as much time to whine. I don't want to let go. <laughs> I just have to do it. Um, right. Exactly. It, it's, it's forced decision-making, I think. Yeah. Yep. It's, well, yeah. let, me, let me ask you a couple questions from writers. We'll start. We'll start with a, a really classic one about where your ideas come from, and she very kindly says um, the ideas for our beautiful stories. You know that's hard because they can come from so many sources. I mean, you know, I can number one, I can hear a song that reminds mm. me of. Thing and I can, you know, then take whatever that aspect of the song is and that develops into a story or or a character will kind of pop into my head and I'll, I'll start thinking about that. Usually it's the guys because I like them. <laughs> <laughs> so newspaper, there's all sorts of, you know, things you read in the news and stuff that it's like, huh. You know, that would make a really interesting book. You know, if you had that in there or, or an occupation that's interesting or, you know, things like that. So from that moment of, huh, that's interesting, then how would you start to shape that into a book? Well, I have to talk a lot. I, I call my friends and I <laughs> Well, I've kind of got an idea, and then, you know, I go into it, and this goes on the entire book until they probably want to kill me, but, <laughs> you know, and I, I finally get it hashed out, like, you know, at the very end, but um, what happens? Like, sometimes, if I really don't know the the person, I'll do an interview, and I don't do interviews like a lot of writers you know, What's their favorite color? What's the, you know, what's the, you know, what's your, I don't know. I don't have any set question. I'll, I'll just ask them what I want to know. Like, why are you avoiding this woman that you obviously like? Oh. You know, usually tell me, shut up. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know? they're all smart asses. I tend to write men that way because I live with them. So there you go. I don't know. It's, I'm struggling right now because my book that I'm working on right now, I'm kind of don't really know the scenes and don't really, I mean, I, I have a vague idea of where I'm going. I, I'm not huge on plotting until I've gotten into it. 
Um, and sometimes not they don't, which is an issue. But that's- do you do you start at the beginning and do you write sequentially? Uh, no, I I used to. I used to always write sequentially, and then I got to where I couldn't, um, especially with that that three time period book. I mean. Mm. You know, I had to do each time period separately. And so I would just work on whichever one struck me that day, you know. So, um, but yeah, I I like to write sequentially because it's easier because then you don't have to go back and say, no, wait a minute, way back here, I said this and now I've said something else. And so I have to go back and fix that. And, you know, it's a pain. Um, but no, I, I don't. In fact, I've skipped ahead to something in this current book. So (laughs) I find it interesting that you, you talk through the stories with your friends. Um, because I, for me, if I talk about a book too much, which is to some extent, almost any, um, my little rabbit monkey brain says, okay, we've told that one. Let's go do something else. (laughs) Uh, So I've got to be really careful not to talk out the story and lose the impetus. Um, No, it doesn't really work that way for me. I I have to figure it out. And I, I figure it out by talking, you know, uh I'll talk to my husband who will say, well, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. (laughs) And I'm like, just, just ignore that. <laughs> and you get, Listen I'm going to use it anyhow. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, that's going to be boring. Just don't worry about that. I will make it not boring, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I, I see what you mean. And sometimes there are some stories I've started that, that just didn't go anywhere, you know. I mean, they, they sounded good at the time and then they just kind of fell apart. So what do you do with those? Do you hold on to them? Pick them in a file, yeah. Yeah, and have you ever come back to any of those and and rescued them? Yes. Ah. Um, Well, not not the ones that are just, ugh, that's not working at all, but um, the ones that, you know, I I started on and I had, say, a proposal, but it didn't go anywhere, and then I – you know, I went back and developed it and it ended up selling, you know, I, I, I've had some books that I wrote that I ended up after I sold that I managed to rewrite and sell. I have some, I have, I have one story that the heroine's name is Shay as in Shea stadium. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm convinced at this point that, my psyche will not let me write that and finish that story um, because I'm a Cub fan. <laughs> so, and yet I can't change her name. I've tried. I have tried. And it didn't yes, work. That's, that drives me crazy. I have one girl in a book, and I, I don't know why, but I named her Mary Lou, and then I decided I didn't like that. Well, I tried my best to change her name, and I could not change it. She was just, uh-uh. <laughs> No, that's my name. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I've had a couple where they were secondary characters and you just sort of name them offhand and then lo and behold, they had become. Well, she wasn't main characters. The heroine. She was the heroine's best friend. But then did she get her own story later? Not yet. Oh, I, you, I have one in mind for her, but no, I haven't written it because it's suspense and it's big, long, complicated suspense and. Uh, I don't know. Those are hard. Well, this year I completed and published a book called Proof of Innocence that I swear I started 15 years ago. And uh, it's like hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I thought, okay, these people are out of my head. But even as I was writing it, uh, well, I knew there was a second book. There might be a third book. So it's like they're multiplying. <laughs> I had, when people said, where, you know, well, how, where do you get all those ideas? It's like ideas are not the issue. <laughs> yeah. Well, because, you know, anything can spark an idea. Yeah. 
So from that spark, uh, from from your initial conception of what the story is going to be, then do you find it changes a lot in the process, or is it pretty true to that initial inspiration? I don't know. That's a hard question. Um, well, let me let me ask you, and maybe in another way, or you, that approach it. Do you have books that surprise you in the in the writing process? Sure. I mean, most of them surprise me at some point. You know, something will happen huh. that I didn't expect, and I'll say, "Oh, huh." And, um, you know, like it, something will happen to the character or something comes up that, you know, I, I had no idea was going to happen and yet it happened. Well, that was like the cat. <laughs> <laughs> and I like cats. <laughs> <laughs> I like dogs too, but I like cats. So don't take me. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so things do surprise you and, um, uh, yeah, in fact, yeah books there'll be something that surprises me and sometimes you know somebody will come in well in fact in my current book the hero's brother is is really trying to take over this book and he's not even in it yet he's just <laughs> I mean, being referred to you know and I'm like go away it's not your time <laughs> but, yeah they don't understand that well do they yeah, yeah. Keep knocking on the door going well wait a minute here I am you need to write my story. Well, I can't. <laughs> You'll have to wait your turn. And they don't like that. <laughs> Another reader asks, where you write your stories, if you have a special place, a favorite place that you write. And um, I, I love that the she asks uh, if it has an inspirational view. And then I'll add on, do you have a routine? Do you follow a writing routine? I write a lot in my office. Well, I... I we have um, a house in, in Texas and a house in uh, Colorado. And when I'm in Colorado, I like to go out on the porch and write because it's pretty and the mountains are there. Mm. You know, it's it's just really nice. Although I do work at the kitchen table a lot because that's what I have to work on there. Um, but in t- Texas... I I have a desk in an office and I write in there and I, I have a window, but I close it most of the time. I used to look out the window all the time in one of my old offices. And in fact, one of my stories came from looking out that window one time. So why do you not look out the window now? I, I don't know. I guess, well, it's partly because of the window. It's this like long window in it it kind of exposes me to the world and bugs me. Mm, mm. And the other was, you know, just a regular window up high so that I could look out, but I didn't feel like anybody could really look in. I know that sounds kind of strange, but. No, I, I understand when when my first office in, when I was in Virginia, looked out at the front of my house, I became much more productive when I moved my office to the back of the house. (laughs) Where, yes, I could look out on trees, and yes, I would go, squirrel, <laughs> bird, look at the bird, ooh. But I w- wasn't seeing people <laughs> so, or, or cars or, you know, right. wondering why they were doing that. And, oh, look at this. And uh, so, yeah. I, and my office now is on the second story, so I kind of see the tops of trees. Um and that works okay for me. Um, some nature, but not too distracting. I, I also have an office in our den with my chair, and I take all my crap in there, and my husband's like, oh, great. Sometimes <laughs> 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 I, I work in there. <laughs> Uh, another another readers. I'm going to pair these two. These are two two different readers asking about um, how much does it bother you to find editing errors after your book goes live or is printed, and then another reader says when the cover image doesn't match the cover description, and she acknowledges that's a pet peeve of hers. How does it feel for the author? Um. The, the cover image, that is, when I wrote for, um, I used to write for Bantam Love Swept and Harlequin Super Romance, and I had a, <laughs> I had a cover 
that was supposed to be set on the Texas coast, and yet it was set on what looked like a lake in Ontario. (laughs) (laughs) How odd. Yeah, and and I was like, this is in no way the Texas coast. I mean, you know, it just wasn't. And uh, that really bugged me. And then, oh, and then they have... Don't, don't mean to rain on Harlequin, but then there was another one where the hero is supposed to be this hot guy, you know, and and she's like older than him, but not that much, like five years or something. And she has two little kids and they there's puppies in there. And so they have this guy and girl, woman and man, supposedly, who look like they're about 17. And he is so dorky. And... um. Then they have the kids who are cute, but, you know, so what? And then they have the puppies. And I was like, why couldn't they just put the puppies on the cover? Why did they have to put this guy? I got mail about that. That's terrible. Blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, that's not my fault. Now, in an indie book, it you know, you have a lot more uh, control over it, obviously. Um. But I also find with um, two of my more recent publishers that that they do a really good job most of the time. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, I I love some of the covers, you know, Um, actually most of them. Um, But one of them I did have a reader say, her hair is not black, and in the book it's totally black. And I was like, huh, well, you know, that was the best picture. I can't help it, you know. Sometimes yeah. you just can't help that. And that that's something that um, a lot of authors who are indie have, have been talking about. There's limited um, choice in the photos and, and especially some limits in not standard looks or not standard views of beauty or attractiveness. Um, so if you write a character who's somewhat, different in in almost any way uh it's really hard to find you know what images that reflect that right now it's hard to find a clean shaven man they've all oh interesting every single one of them and it's like oh come on not everybody has stubble but (laughs) technically on books they do and and i have this thing you know if it's on the book then i need to make the guy you know, at least try to make the guy look like that. And sometimes he doesn't, and it annoys me. Yes, it does. But, and it, as for errors, I, you know, they happen. I mean, you do the best you can. Several people look at it. It goes through all sorts of processes. And you still, you know, I, I in fact, found one. Um, I had done an indie book, and I... Got a paper, I made a paperback of it and I looked at it and I found a typo in the first page. I was like, yeah. thank you. How did that happen? You know? <laughs> so, yeah, it bugs me. But again, you know, there's some things that you, you can't really worry about. I mean, yes, if there's tons of typos and stuff, then yes. But I am very fortunate about that and I haven't had anything that had tons of them. Oh, yes, you can worry about it. <laughs> it drives me nuts. So I do ask readers if if you spot things, let me know yeah. and we will fix them. And that's one of the that is one of the things I love the best about Indy, that I will go back and change and fix things. And of course, you know, the the reader who spotted it. I'm I'm very grateful because you've spared other readers. Um, I'm sorry it, you had to see it, but we'll keep getting better and better. And um, uh, yes, because they drive yeah. me nuts. Well, I don't like them either. I don't think anybody does. Some people are more philosophical than others. I'm not very philosophical about it. So, did you find um, when was your first book out? 1996. And did you find that? Publishing, having that first book published, did that change your writing in any way or your process? Uh, yeah, it became harder because, you know, you learn more. Mm. You know, you, you, when I first wrote, I mean, I wrote a bunch of books very fast because 
I didn't know anything, you know, <laughs> I just wrote and I really enjoyed it, but you know, I don't know that. And then you have deadlines and that of course changes things. Um, it, they, I used to not do as well. Now I'm like, I, I tend to, like we talked about earlier, I seem to need a deadline to actually get something accomplished. When you say you didn't do as well, you, you meant you, you went past deadline or? No, I got them in on time, but I, I get burned out. Oh. Cause I, you know, I couldn't write as fast as I was writing without getting very long. Now I, I've been fortunate that I seem to have come to terms with it, shall we say. (laughs) How did you recover when you felt you were burnt out? Oh, I took time off. I mean, at one point I took four years off because my personal life was a mess. You know, people were dying and all sorts Uh, of things. And I just, I couldn't write. Um, And so at that point I thought I was not going to write anymore. And then... um, I talked to Deb Dixon at Bell mm-hmm. Books, and that's where Cry Love came from. That was my first book back. And, of course, I had to pick, like, the hardest book I've ever written. To <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, it, it was so hard, and I was like, why did I do this to myself? You know, I don't know. I guess I thought I needed the challenge. I don't know. Well, once you got past that, other things looked easier, see? Well, I thought that, but then my very next book was really hard, too. So, (laughs) I don't know. They're all kind of varying degrees of hard and, you know, but there is that sort of the rush when you get a a scene that you like and it's fun and you know it's going well and it's like, oh, yes, yes, yes. That's what I write for. Yep. Yep. And it, all of a sudden, time has passed, and you go, "Wait a minute, what what happened?" Or, you know, the the thing that seems to happen to me a lot is I'll be writing away, and I'll be really en- engrossed in the scene, and uh, I have no sense of time passing, and and then the dog wants to go out, and I let the dog out, and it's like, "Wait a minute, I was in Wyoming in March, <laughs> and it's <laughs> it's now Kentucky in June, and." This is wrong. <laughs> Where? How did this happen? <laughs> so, we're in book world, you know? Yes, book world. Absolutely. Now, do you celebrate any of your markers with a book? Do you celebrate beginning or ending or, or publication or anything like that? Um, I, I celebrate the ending when I write the ending or send it off or something like that. Um, by eating chocolate. <laughs> Recur- Good plan. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll go out to dinner or something. But, um, and then when it comes out, I just, I'm always really happy because, you know, it's exciting when a book comes out. It's like, oh, look, it's there. Yeah, I'm, it, it's interesting to me. Finishing to me is... Um, much more satisfying than the book coming out. Maybe I shouldn't say that because when the book comes out, I'm already kind of mentally into the next one. Oh yeah, and 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 into that book world, and it's like, oh yeah, that that's kind of in my rearview mirror. You know, <laughs> I'm already moving on, but um, I should be better about celebrating. <laughs> I, keep, I, I I like your chocolate idea. Yeah. I think I may adapt that. Chocolate, definitely. But um, so I never celebrate the first of a book. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> What's your relationship with reviews? <laughs> Love hate. <laughs> <laughs> and you can guess which is which. <laughs> <laughs> I I do. I like the ones. Well, of course, I like the good ones. Everybody does, but I like if it's if it's a a reasoned, you know, response like you know this wasn't for me because of whatever, or you know something that doesn't sound like. I really don't like the reviews that are like I hate this book, <laughs> I hate this author, you know, and it's like whoa, wait a minute, I, I uh, what did I do? And you know sometimes you can tell it's you've hit a bad spot to somebody and and 
Mm-hmm. You know, but that happens. I mean, there are books I've read that, you know, I don't like. I mean, some who, that are very famous that lots of people like. Um, but, you know, it's everybody's taste. But, um, yeah, I'd say love, hate. Yeah, it's because it's, to me it's always the match between the author and the reader and um, tr- finding a good match. I mean, not everybody's going to like your stuff. Right. They just don't. Right. And I and I think a, a reviewer who specifies their reading experience, good or bad, you know, that's their reading experience. Yeah. That that's and and because it's interactive, um, you know, the the writer puts it out there, but it's also what the reader takes from it. So you're totally. Uh, my view is that the reviewer is totally. Um, right in, in acknowledging their reading experience. Um, the ones I think the ones that bug me the most are the ones that are inaccurate. Yes. You know, they, they blame you for something that is it, not there yeah. or is there. And they say it's not there. And I, you know, <laughs> that's the journalist in me coming back <laughs> and going, that's wrong. But I think it's something like um, something that you actually do know about and they take you to task for not knowing about it. And it's like, um, sorry, but you know, I got this, you know, it's frustrating because I, I lived with a doctor who was a general surgeon and then a radiologist and his father was a doctor and my daughter's in medicine. And so, you know, I, I try to get that as accurate as I can. Mm -hmm. It, It can't be totally accurate because, you know, being married to a general surgeon, they're never there. So that's not very romance oriented, you know, even though we make them romancy and that's not what real life is like. Yeah. 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 It's just not. Um, (laughs) I probably shouldn't say that, but because I do write a lot of doctor. Another reader has asked, do you miss your characters when you finish a story? Um, and, And the, I think the reader definitely does. But, and do you think about them? Um, often the day are, you know, they show up in other stories, not as hero or heroine, but, uh, you know, they'll, they'll have a part in another story. Um, so yeah, I guess I miss them because I put them in other stories. A lot. <laughs> What's your favorite part of writing? What's your favorite part of the process? When it's going well. When it mm. you know, that oh my god this is so good oh, it's just oh, wonderful and and then of course you read it later and it's like well hmm might need some work <laughs> but, um, yeah probably that and I like to read I like to revise um, I like to revise hmm. my stuff but when my editor wants me to revise I don't always like that even though they're generally right. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, sometimes it's frustrating and then you think, well, I don't need to do that. And then you look at it later and it's like, yeah, she's right. Well, if you get stuck while you're writing, how, how do you deal with that? Oh, I have a variety of ways. One of the ways is I do the interview and I'll sit them down mm-hmm. and ask them what it is that I'm stuck on that I need to know. Or um, sometimes it's a simple, and it drives me crazy because it takes me a while to figure this out, but I need to change the point of view. And once I change the point of view, it starts flowing again. I'm like, oh, why didn't I do that before? Why did I spend three days, you know, racking my brain? What's wrong? What's wrong? When I could have just done this originally. Well, I don't know. But uh and then uh, sometimes it's just wrong. Like, ooh, I had to take a bunch of words out the other day, and I hate to do that. And, <laughs> and I had to take them out because it was wrong. And I saved it, though. <laughs> but I took it out. So, uh, so you put it in your save file yes, and I, maybe I bring it back in at some and point. And started again in a, and went in a different direction, and it worked. So, you know, obviously that was the problem. Um and then sometimes I'll just stop and go watch a movie or something, eat chocolate. 
if there are uh, listeners who are not familiar with the the phrase um, change the you know, point of view, what we're talking about is usually you're seeing um, you as the reader are seeing uh, a scene through the eyes of one character, and that's the point of view character. Yeah, I when I first started writing it, I wasn't aware of any of that and but what made sense to me was um that if you imagined that you were experiencing the book like uh you would a movie that you were who's who was the movie camera that was seeing everything in front of them um or around them i've never thought of it that way and writing is like if you're in the um the woman's point of view she is not going to talk about her dazzling blue eyes. And <laughs> first of all, most women are more self-critical than that, but also she can't see them because <laughs> she's looking out from them. I know so. that my beautiful blue eyes are sparkling and wonderful. <laughs> uh, okay. So what else? is there anything I haven't asked you that you would like to answer? We haven't talked about research. What drives me crazy is I'll go in to look at something and I'll end up, you know, looking at what what a herd of giraffes is called or something. And which has no no bearing on anything I've been looking up. But um, and then I've forgotten what I was supposed to be looking up. But uh, yeah, I like um, I like having different things to research um, like that. But Cry Love, I had lots and lots of research on that. And um, the one I'm working on now is the third in a trilogy. And um, it's uh, set at a private airport. And so, of course, I I got to listen to, ooh, all sorts of interesting things. Like, you know, they ha- on the Internet, they have, um, on YouTube, they'll have, like, a people talking about, there was one about a a man who was flying a private plane in a private plane and the pilot died. Oh my God. Died. And this guy had never flown a plane. I mean, he'd been in them a bunch and they, and it was in England and they, you know, it took them forever and it was falling. It was about nightfall and it was, you know, everything you can imagine. And this guy was so calm and so great. And they took him there and he landed the plane. And two weeks later, he started taking lessons. <laughs> oh, But wow. listening to them was just fascinating. Mm-hmm. So um, I did a lot of that kind of thing. That was fun. Do you have any great stories about readers? Oh, yeah, actually. Um, I have several. Um, one of them that's always stayed with me was from back when I wrote for Love Swift. And the heroine in this book was big. She was a big woman. You know, she was tall. She was big. She was not scrawny. And, you know, it, it didn't really bother her. But, um, it, and she wasn't, she wasn't fat per se. She, but she was big. She was not a small woman. And the hero, of course, fell in love with her anyway. And that didn't seem to bother him. He thought she was beautiful. And, um, and I really had to stretch on that. I had to talk to one of my friends who was tall because as you said, I'm not. And so it was a totally different experience for me. And, and she was a different type person. I mean, than I had ever written. She was, she was really nice. <laughs> I mean, she, mm. You know, mm. anyway. Um, but I had reader write and say, I am so glad that the big girl got the hunk. Oh, and you know, yeah. and it, it and she went on and and said a bunch of nice things, but you know, you could tell it it would touch her, and that that's a that's a neat feeling, you know. That's we, great. We know that not everybody is a size two, <laughs> so um, yeah, that was nice. And then um, I had oh oh a few months ago, I had a. Uh, Something, I can't remember whether I was doing, it was something on Facebook and I can't remember whether I was, at, somebody was having one of those party kind of things and people, you know, 
you, you do your thing for 15 minutes and they come. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and I had several people say something about one of them said, I've been reading your books since your love sweat days. And I was like, wow, that's really. Cool. Yeah. Know, I don't know that readers know how much something like that means to us to know that, you know, they, they do read your books and they search for your books and they've read all or almost all your books. I mean, that's really neat to hear. And, that is, and I don't, yeah. I don't know that that they even realize that sometimes, but they are. We do. We love it. <laughs> <laughs> I had early on in my career, I had somebody write me. I had a few books out because she wrote, "I've, I've read all your books and I just love them." And <laughs> I wrote back and said. Are you sure you mean me? And it could be. And I had a couple other authors whose names were, I thought were sort of similar. And she wrote back and said, "Yes, I mean you." <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so some of us are better at taking compliments than others. Oh, how cool. <laughs> I'm always shocked. I still feel like a newbie, even though I've been published for a long time. But, you know, I I still feel that sort of wonder that somebody's actually read my books, you know? Yeah, that is, that is amazing. (laughs) And, and wonderful. Yeah. Um, my first book was out, out in 1990. One of the things that, that gets me now is, um, with the indie, authors is people somebody's going well i've been around forever i first published in 2011 <laughs> and i'm like <laughs> uh, <laughs> that might have been the beginning of indie but that was yeah. you know uh that was that was fairly early yeah, in indie that, actually there awesome. were people oh nine so um yeah that's when it took off I, my first books were out in 2010 but, but there were people well before me um in, in in indie and online but uh yeah 2011 you're still a you're still a baby author <laughs> yeah um okay and well you know we've been talking about readers and and stuff what where would be a good place for somebody who hasn't read any of your books to come into your work? What, what are a couple of your books that would be good introductions? Um, well, I have a, a couple of free ones. Um, one of them is Trouble in Texas, and it's the first book in my indie series now um, that's set on the Texas coast, and it's romantic suspense, but the books are a mixture. There's like seven of them. And there are some of them are romantic suspense and some of them are plain romance. And um, like I say, it's free. So that would probably be a good place to start if, if you like uh, romantic suspense. And if that's not for you, the next one is called A Marriage Made in Texas. And it's not romantic suspense, but it's not free, but it's on sale. And, ah, but yeah, that gives people a choice. Yeah. And then also my newer series um that i'm starting and the first one's it's the airport one it's called devil's rock airport Mm. and devil's rock at whiskey river and the first book is called rebel pilot texas doctor wow and it's coming out june 14th and you can pre-order it so that that's you know I think indicative of that well what I'm writing by the time this by the time the podcast comes out the book will be out yes so. and it's it's uh it's indicative I think of what I write and I'm Terrific. working on a uh well I'm not working on it yet but I'm going to be part of a new community set in Texas from Thule Publishing and I'm going to be one of the launch authors and. Uh, it's uh my thing is called Doctors in Love. And when will that be out? Uh sometime in 2019. Probably spring of 2019. And what's the whole project hold ser- uh, community called? Uh Last Stand. Okay. Great. So, um 
anyway, that'll be fun because, you know, I love to write Texas books too. Uh, and then I have some set in Montana. Anyway. Um, do you do you have um, from your for your regular readers? Do you have any books that uh, I like to think of them as you know overlooked gems that maybe don't get as much attention as your other books do that that you'd like to highlight to to your readers? Cry Love, which is really different, um, but it it means a lot to me, and I I happen to think it's a really good book. Um, but it was my first book back from my long, you know, um, my, what I thought was my retirement and did not turn out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I have a, that long romantic suspense called last shot. And it's, I, you know, I don't know. I think it's a really good romantic suspense and I loved it. Um, it was hard. <laughs> But, um, and it was a, a story I had in my mind for a long time. Actually, both mm. of those were. Uh, so now my very favorite part, either ors. Okay. And rapid fire. Okay. I'm going to say opera or show tunes. <laughs> uh, Too bad. You have to pick one. Opera or show tunes. Show tunes. Paper plates are best china. Paper. Day or night? Mm -hmm. Day. Heels or slippers? Uh, slippers. Appetizer or dessert? Dessert. Uh, house decorating or gardening? Ew. <laughs> uh, house decorating. Paint or wallpaper? Hey. Thank you. <laughs> Pick up or sports car? Sports car. Really? That is okay. Hiking boots or cowboy boots? Uh probably hiking boots. Daisies or roses? Roses. Ice cream or cake? Ice cream. Well Crew Uh oh. Maybe. Uh -oh. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Cruise or trekking vacation? Uh, I think I'd rather cruise. <laughs> I, can't I, got, I got that. Okay. Um, cat or dog? Dog. Hot air balloon or train trip? Train. You know, hot air balloon, the height. Ah, okay. Um, coffee or tea? Coffee. Winter Olympics or Summer Olympics? Mm, well, I love them both, but probably winter. Yay. Uh, nail polish or bare nails? Depends. I have bare nails on my hand and polish on my toes. Ah, is that usual? Yep. We usually do. Okay. And this is the last one. Have the best first or save the best for last? Um, save it. Save it for last. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Eve, for visiting with us thank and sharing your writing experiences. Really appreciate it. It's been fun. And hope all of you will come back next week to hear another writer and the stories behind their stories. Until then, I'm wishing you lots of happy reading. That's the show for this week. Hope you enjoyed it. And thank you for joining Authors Love Readers podcast. Remember, you can always find out more about our guest authors in the show notes. And you can find out more about me at www.patriciamclin.com. You can also send in questions to be asked of future authors at podcast at authorslovereaders.com. Until next week. Wishing you lots of happy reading. Bye. 
If you like this podcast, we hope you'll consider becoming a supporter through our Patreon page. With a small monthly donation as little as a dollar a month, you can help with the hosting and editing costs that make the show possible. To thank our Patreon supporters, we offer them special bonuses. Find out more at authorslovereaders.com or at patreon.com slash authorslovereaders. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. We also hope you'll subscribe to this podcast and leave us a review wherever you listen to us. Both of those help more folks find the podcast. Of course, the very best way for other folks to find the podcast is for you to tell them about it. So we sure hope you will. Hi, I'm Eve Gaddy, and my writing tip is if you're having trouble and are stuck in a scene, try to change the point of view and see if it works better.